1988, the federal government, the United States government, held a big hearing, Congress had a commission and so on, and finally the United States government decided that they did wrong to the Japanese and Japanese Americans, so they apologized for the residents who had been in camp at the time of the signing were still living. So, and they also gave uh, reparations of $20,000 per room. So she got $20,000, I got $20,000. My daughter did because she never went to camp. But uh, only probably less than half of the people were living at that time because this is 48 years later. And most of the older people had already died off. So. Uh, in all, the federal government paid $1.2 billion in reparation, but the United States government was gracious enough to say, hey, if you were wrong, we're sorry. We apologize for that. And so they put all the put up markers like that. There's lots of markers like this. But not Pinedale, but at Park Mountain, and Minidoka, and Mandanar, and to this day. Well, this is the end of our presentation, but uh, we, we'd like to talk about some other things. How many of you heard of Korematsu? Anybody here? <laughs> I thought you're. Oh, They're watching it when in this next period. The oh, morning people oh, got it okay. beforehand. Now, coming up is going to be something about Korematsu. If you don't know anything about Korematsu, there are four people who challenged either the evacuation or some of the law. These, these are all, you say, like me, okay? Challenge the law that says that you're going to go to camp whether you like it or not. Four people, too, uh, actually, three people. Mm -hmm. People said that they were not going to obey that law, so they challenged it, so they contested the law. One of them was Fred Korematsu, and he is a well known iconic figure in the Japanese community now. But there were others. The first one actually that challenged that was my brother Minori Asui. He did not challenge the uh, evacuation order. What he did, he challenged the curfew law. The curfew law was an order promulgated by General DeWitt, who was the high monkey muck in the West, the Defense Command. And he said, all people of Japanese ancestry will remain within their home in the period between 8 o'clock at night and 6 o'clock in the morning. And he said, all people of Japanese ancestry, it did not apply to German, it did not apply to German Indian, it did not apply to German Italian, uh, Italian American, just Japanese American. Moreover, you can't travel more than five miles radius from the place of residence. So my brother said, that's not right. Just picking on a Japanese citizen, Japanese-American citizen, and saying you can't do it. Well, how about the German-American uh, citizen, the Italian-American citizen? How come not them? I'm going to challenge that. So he, he was a lawyer by that time. He was important. He just a fresh view down to hear lawyer. And he tried to get a volunteer, of, you know, preferably a veteran, a, a Japanese veteran of World War I with kids and so on. So, you know. Good, good vibrations, but nobody wanted to do that. Who wants to be a soccer player, you know, volunteering for something? So you know what that fool did? He volunteered himself, <laughs> and he got pinched. He got arrested. He, he spent the next night, he, got, he, he was convicted, too. But the interesting thing about this conviction was my, my brother had wasn't, wasn't able to make much money practicing law in Portland, so he got a job in Chicago. But his mistake, if it was a mistake, was that he worked for the Japanese consulate in Chicago as an advisor and, and a kind of a speech writer. Well, okay, long story short, we go back to his trial, he challenges the cop and cop, says, run along, you know, and I, he's, he's out at 11 o'clock at night, you're supposed to be home by 8 o'clock. He goes up to the cop, the guy says, gone, I'm going to you. You're going to get in trouble, okay? So the cop wouldn't arrest him in Portland. So my stupid brother walks into the precinct police station and says, you've got to arrest me. And that's the sergeant says, what for? He says, I broke the curfew law. Here's my paper. Here's the citizenship papers. And he got arrested. He says, sure. <laughs> so I threw him in the drunk tank on a Friday night. My brother forgot. Friday night, nothing happens on Saturday and Sunday. So he stayed in the drunk tank on Saturday and Sunday. And then, then Monday, his lawyer came and bailed him out. So he, got, he, he spent the weekend good. But, Fast forward a little bit more, he went to trial for Judge James Alder Fee, a federal judge in Portland. Judge Fee had a very interesting theory. He said, yes, sir, you're right. This law is unconstitutional when applied to American citizens. Therefore, you know, like you, Japanese American citizens, would not be subject to this curfew order because that's unconstitutional. But, yes, sir, 
by virtue of having worked for the Japanese consulate, you lost your American citizen, therefore you're a Japanese citizen, mm -hmm. therefore I find you guilty and I throw you in jail. Mm -hmm. So he got, according to Judge James Oliver Street, that's pretty well, the, it, the law, curfew law was unconstitutional as applied to American citizens. But if so he had lost his well, he went to, went to the appeals court, appeal court remanded it to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court joined his conviction together with Korematsu's case, Fred Korematsu's case. We talk, you can talk about that later, or we'll talk about it before if you want to. But anyway, so Min spent the next nine months in solitary confinement in the Momo County Jail with a fine of 5,000 bucks. The Supreme Court, when they reviewed the Korematsu's case, and uh, I'm sorry, not Korematsu, I'm sorry, back up, back up. He, he was, his case, Min's case, my brother's case was, was connect, attached to Hirabayashi's case. Gordon Hirabayashi was one of the other four uh, challengers to the, to the evacuation and the curfew. Uh, but the Supreme Court in Hirabayashi found Hirabayashi guilty, but he found, the Supreme Court found that Min was also guilty. He did, had not lost his citizenship, therefore he was still an American citizen, and, there, and the law, the curfew law was a valid law. It was not unconstitutional. So the Supreme Court sent the case back to Judge A.M. Alderfee and said, make a different claim. <coughs> so Judge Alderfee says, okay, I'm sorry I made a mistake. You didn't lose your citizenship, but you're guilty of disobeying that curfew according to the Supreme Court. So he ended up nine months in the jail. But he did forgive the 5,000 feet. But the downside of it is it cost him our family, 40,000 bucks to defend that case. But anyway, long, long story. Many years later, 1984 now, there came a series of young people, well, not married as eight, that's the third generation of them, and they said, hey, wait a minute, our parents are screwed, you know? We should be going to have to fight this. So they reopened these, these challenging cases, and among them was a brother's case under an obscure law court. Uh, rid of her quorum nobis, meaning that, which means that you were found guilty, but you've already served your sentence and so on, but there was an error in the ju original judgment. And so when they went to the court again, <coughs> this is 84 now, many, many years later, the federal government agreed that they had received the, the jury and the judges, and so they had done wrong, and so the sentence was vacated. Well, that didn't do my brother much good because he died two years later before the redress property came. But the important thing is the federal government has agreed that they were dead wrong, and in the Korematsu case, the Hirabayashi case, they have admitted and apologized for their error. What they did is they concealed evidence and made it possible to find Korematsu and Hirabayashi and Yasui guilty. Okay, that, that's the Yasui case.